Um, good afternoon and welcome to this EPC online briefing on the economic outlook for Europe in 2021. Uh, my name is Marta Pilati. I'm policy analyst at the European Policy Center, where I work on economic and regional policy and, and the EU budget. Um, I have the pleasure today to moderate a discussion with two great panelists. Uh, we have Declan Costello, Deputy Director General of DG ECFIN, a European Commission, and Aida Caldera Sanchez, uh, Councillor to the UECD Chief Economist. Uh, thank you both for being here to present and discuss the EU economy and economic policies. Before we start, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, the event will last one hour and we will begin with two 10 minutes presentations from both speakers. Uh, then we will have 40 minutes of interactive discussions. Uh, members of the audience can ask questions in two ways. You can type in the Q&A box and then I will read it out loud. So please keep it uh, short and to the point. So that's easier for me to read it. Or you can also raise your virtual hand and then I will give you the floor to ask your question um, orally. Um, let us begin. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis has deeply impacted the world's economies, of, of course, including the EU, its member states. Um, unprecedented policy measures have been implemented over the course of 2020 to support the economy and citizens. But while a partial bounce back can be expected this year, uncertainty still reigns. So today we discuss the economic prospects for the EU, what's needed for spurring the recovery, and how to sustain long-term growth while undergoing structural transformations. Um, let's start with the presentation from our speakers. Um, the clan, you will go first, so the floor is yours, please. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Marta. Good afternoon, everybody. And it's a, a great honor to be able to uh, present and talk to uh, such a, a large and distinguished audience. Um, so what I would like to do today in my presentation is just briefly recall uh, our latest economic forecast, which we published uh, in November, comment upon some of the most recent information that we have received and what that implies for the economic prospects, both in the short and medium term. And then I'd like to turn to some of the sort of key policy challenges uh, we're going to face uh, in 2021. So maybe if we can turn to the, the first slide. Um, so here, uh, back in uh, November, early November, um, obviously we, we were forecasting that the EU uh, economy would decline in real terms uh, by just over seven percentage points uh, last year with uh, you know, a fairly strong rebound in 2021 and 2022. Um, now, this was, of course, it's an unprecedented economic shock. Um, the biggest impact was in uh, quarter two of last year. Um, there was a fairly strong rebound in Q3, actually slightly stronger than we had initially anticipated, which uh, momentum was sustained into the fourth quarter, but we saw some uh, negative developments regarding the pandemic towards the, towards the, towards the uh, uh, back end of the year. If we can go to the next slide. I think it's one thing I, I want to sort of, I think it's important to realize that whilst the, 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 the shock itself in, in form of pandemic was uh, uh, a symmetric shock affecting all countries, its economic impact has not been identical. And that has partly depended upon the, the impact of the pandemic, the, the, the scale and nature of the containment measures that were put in place, but also due to the, uh, the, the different economic structures of our economy, uh, with the biggest impact upon those economies which rely heavily, most heavily on the service sector, uh, tourism, uh, you know, sectors where sort of face-to-face -face inter interventions uh, are, are needed. Now, what we were, what this slide shows you is actually the, the cumulative impact we were expecting uh, from the end of 2009 through to 2022. And what you can see is that whilst there's a number of economies that would have recovered uh, fully by the end of 2022, there are quite a few economies, uh, notably larger euro area economies, uh, where we were not expecting the recovery to have been completed by the, you know, the sort of two years out. So the, I think this sort of asymmetric economic impact is an important feature of the, of the pandemic. And also it very much reflects the policy response we put in, 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 uh, uh, in play at European level, uh, which is really trying to target at those which are most impacted. If we can go to the next slide, um, now, what this slide is showing is the projected, uh, comparing the, the impacts of, um, showing the impacts on deficits and debt levels, but just contrasting that to the previous global financial crisis, just to underline that these are, are two very different uh, economic shocks which have hit our economy. I guess the, the, the most important point here is, um, one of the positive features of the, you know, one of the good things that came out of the, the crisis was actually that uh, the, the, the policy response, certainly in Europe, 
was much swifter, uh, much deeper uh, than, than, than was the case in uh, the global financial crisis. Now, in terms of direct fiscal support, injections into our economy, these amounted to four percentage points of GDP last year, uh, as on average in the EU. And then combined with that, there were other sort of supports, mostly liquidity supports, uh, tax deferrals, uh, guarantees, and these amounted to over 20 percentage points of GDP. Now that has played a very, very important uh, part in cushioning the uh, helping economies cope with the, the impact of the pandemic. But it is going to have a, you know, a dramatic impact upon our public finance positions going forward. And we're, you know, we're expecting to see debt to GDP levels somewhere between 15 and percentage, point, uh, percentage points higher at the end of 2022 compared to what they otherwise uh, would have been. And bear in mind, in some countries, the starting level of debt was, was quite high. If we could go to the next slide. Um, now here, uh, again, uh, what, what we see here, this shows uh, 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 unemployment levels, which, which have tracked up in the course of 2020. But given the scale of the economic shock, the impact on, on labor markets has been very, very muted compared to what one would have expected. Now, this is largely due to the, uh, the very large scale and rapid uh, income support schemes that have been, uh, that have been rolled out and, and, now, and now are being extended. And we think, we think this is actually a very, very positive feature of the policy response. It has been supported at European level by the SURE project, uh, which provides uh, con uh, concessional loans to help uh, member states finance this. But I guess the, the, you know, a couple of things worth noting. We do expect the uh, labor market situation to continue to deteriorate uh, at least into 2021. Um, so as the, uh, the, the, the temporary supports wear off on the you know, assuming the pandemic uh, abates, um, we do expect some scarring effects on the labor market. And what these figures are maybe hiding a little bit is um, they're not actually showing participation rates. So uh, participation rates overall have declined by about three percentage points uh, during the course of last year. And that just that shows that some people are discouraged and withdrawing from the labor market. So the impact on the labor market must let much less than we could have expected. But actually, we're not really sure what the longer term impact here. And there could be some permanent scarring effects. And that's an important point for policymakers. Could we go to the next slide? Now, maybe just to sort of update you on the most recent developments. Now, since we published our forecast uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, mid-November, the basic message here is that in the short term, uh, conditions uh, prospects have deteriorated, but over the medium term, uh, they probably have actually improved. Now, here, what you see on the slide are, are some latest data on COVID cases and sort of the measures on the stringency. And I guess, I guess what you've seen is that uh, the number of cases has tended to increase. Governments have uh, uh, extended restrictions or reimposed restrictions, maybe not quite to the level that we saw back in the first wave, but nonetheless, uh, we have seen uh, this is having a big impact upon economic activity. We haven't got Q4 data yet, but we don't, we don't expect it to be positive. And so we do expect that these containment measures, notwithstanding the, the rollout of the vaccine, uh, will remain in place probably for at least the first two quarters of the year before a material change can take place. And so we do expect the economic conditions in the nearer term to be more negative uh, than, we, uh, than we anticipated back in November. If I can turn to the next slide, how, um, actually what the next slide sl shows here, it sort of confirms uh, a bit that um, the, the, the actual economic impact is very, there's, a, there's a sort of K-shaped impact. So uh, very rather, you know, rather positive developments in some sectors, notably manufacturing. Um, but that very, very much contrasts with uh, much, much less favorable prospects and recent developments when it comes to those uh, service sectors, which, are, which rely most on face-to-face -face, uh, face -face contact. Turning to the next slide. But as I said, in the medium term, we do actually think that the prospects have actually improved considerably compared to the, the latter part of last year. And the first, I mean, you know, was really the driving factor, and which will probably be the biggest factor uh, shaping the economic uh, developments in 2001, is the actual rollout of the vaccines. So we now, okay, in Europe, we have two vaccines which have been approved. Uh, further vaccines are expected to come on stream. There have been some teething problems in the actual rollout of the vaccine, uh, the vaccine process, but our expectation is that this will accelerate uh, considerably. Um, now, it remains to be seen, of course, how fast this rollout can actually occur. But in terms of making the economic forecast, I think it is a material change in the sense that uh, it's really a question of uh, when uh, mass vaccination can be completed, not, not whether. And so I think this, there, are, there is some uncertainty about the, the timing of uh, the lifting of restrictions 
and the economic rebound that might be associated with it, but it's not so much a question of the weather. So I think looking at our projections, our, our expectation is um, latter Q4 of last year, first two quarters of, of, of this year, likely to be a bit, uh, bit more subdued than we had anticipated. In a sense, the recovery, however, should probably be delayed towards uh, the, the, the second half of the year. But I think the availability of, of, of you know, mass vaccination is actually a game changer in terms of, 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 of the likelihood of a recovery. Three other positive features to note. First, uh, obviously we have an agreement on the recovery and resilience facility uh, at the European Council. Uh, I'll, I'll say a couple of words on that later. Um, we also, of course, now have an, uh, a, a free trade agreement uh, with the UK. Uh, that was not the baseline assumption in our forecast of November. And finally, you know, there are some indications that the global economic outlook has improved. We have a new administration in the United States and that raises the prospects of uh, more fiscal support measures coming there. Maybe turning to some sort of policy changes, as I said, um, now, now I think, uh, you know, there is, I think, uh, very much a consensus, uh, certainly in finance ministers in the EU, that it's important that the, 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 the emergency supports necessary to support our healthcare systems, necessary to support companies and, and, and workers, uh, whilst the pandemic is, uh, is, is prevalent, these do need to remain in place as long as is needed, as long as healthcare conditions require. There is also a general consensus, I should say, around uh, the need to maintain fiscal policy support, a positive a supportive fiscal stance, uh, and not to withdraw this too soon. Now, the general escape clause of the Stability and Growth Pact is currently in force. It will remain in place at least until the end of 21. We will come back to when uh, that, that might be lifted. But again, I think there is a general consensus uh, that we should avoid the policy mistakes of the past and withdraw fiscal policy uh, supports uh, too soon. However, I think nonetheless, uh, you know, the policy trade-offs going forward, the choices which have to be made are in many ways are actually a little bit more acute uh, than, uh, than, than, was, than was the case to some extent in, 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 in the full wave of the pandemic. I mean, one of the sort of key questions which we will have to address, it was on the agenda of finance ministers even this week, um, you know, was, you know, can we come up with uh, a good design of policies on when we should withdraw these emergency income supports and, and debt moratoria, which were essential during the, the pandemic and which need, you know, need to continue for some time. How can we kind of withdraw those progressively, but in a way which avoids cliff edges, cliff edge effects, but at the same time, you know, progresses at a pace and with designs that we're not actually supporting, you know, companies or, or you know, corporates which are fundamentally insolvent or trying to protect jobs which ultimately cannot be protected and which need to move on to new sectors of activities. It's easy to say, you know, the argument is one should, you know, move progressively towards more targeted supports. The challenge is in practice, how do you actually design that targeting and get the right incentive structures in place? On the fiscal policy side, I said, while there's a, a general agreement that the fiscal stance needs to remain supportive for, for, for some time, at some stage, there will be a need to ensure that our, our, fiscal, you know, our fiscal balances are on a path that ensures sustainability. And of course, in Europe, we have the question on how can we move back towards a, a process of normal fiscal surveillance? I think it's clear we can't go back to the, 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 the previous regime in, you know, from one step from, from one day to another. But at the same time, to have some sort of credible fiscal anchor, uh, which can help guide um, national budgets going forward, is going to be important. And then, obviously, there's a the final challenge: we, we we need to put in, you know, the, the fiscal supports which have been put in place. How can we ensure that the, you know these are designed in a way which we we actually build back better, that we actually you know ensure that the investments and reforms we uh, support, so, you know, actually contribute to the digital transition. And tackle and you know and 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 support uh, the resilience of our economies uh, in, in, in a meaningful way. For the last slide, um, now the key thing here, I think, at uh, in terms of the European level, is the actual rollout and, and implementation of the recovery and resilience uh, uh, facility. Um, as I say, the, there is political agreement. The legislation has been adopted. We're now moving uh, very much to the implementation phase. The potential size of this, I guess the, the headline figures are well known uh, in terms of 750 billion euros in total, about half of that in the forms of grants, again, targeted very much towards the member states which have been most affected. Um, I can say more, I mean, I'm, I probably don't have time to go into it now, but I mean, just in terms of the expected economic impacts, we would expect this to have uh, a positive impact on GDP uh, by 2% uh, over the next uh, three years, creating about two, two, 2 million jobs. 
I think the key thing to also stress, and I come back to my one of my initial slides on the, the divergent impact of the pandemic, the impact will be greatest on those countries which have been affected most and where catching up effects are still important. And it will also have a positive, make a positive contribution to debt sustainability and debt to GDP ratios in those member states where risks are greatest. Uh, Marta, thanks very much and I'll stop here. Um, thanks, Declan, uh, for, for all these interesting points. Uh, you've mentioned many things. I'm sure we'll come back to, to most of it. Um, not, well, not many, many, not most. Um, uh, notably, fiscal sustainability, um, what to do in the short term, the recovery facility, um, and all of that. So thank you very much for that. Um, Aida, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marta, and, and good afternoon, everyone. So while the slides turn on, it's a pleasure to be here in this discussion with uh, the plan. So what I thought to do, if we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, what I thought to do today is, um, is to give you a short overview of the economic outlook as seen by the OECD. Our latest projections were published in December. And then I'm going to, to discuss what I see are the short-term uh, policy challenges and then conclude with a few thoughts about more long-term challenges in terms of digitalization of climate. And I think I will agree in many instances with Declan, and I hope that I can offer some light on those challenges that he pointed out uh, towards the end of the presentation. So we can move to the next slide, please. So here, what I'm showing is, um, is our projections uh, from December. So this is global GDP. And the orange line, what it shows you is the path of uh, GDP that we are projecting uh, for 2021 and 2022. And the main point here is that we are going to see a gradual but uneven recovery. And this is dependent on the vaccine, of course, and that it will be widely distributed and fast. Um, maybe an important point on the size of the crisis uh, that we've seen. You can see in the blue line, that's, the, um, that's what we projected last year uh, before the pandemic hit. And what this shows you is that the impact has been huge on the world economy. So, so the losses is the combined GDP of Germany and France. So, so the impact of the pandemic has been very, very large. And of course, uh, there's, very, there's much uncertainty about, uh, about the economy, which makes making forecasts quite difficult. So here I've also shown uh, two scenarios that are included in our projections. Uh, a downside scenario, that's the red line, and, I, and an upside scenario, that's the, the green line. So on the upside, is on the, the red line, the downside scenario, this is if uh, vaccines would be much, much slower uh, deployed. Uh, of course, the impact on the world economy of the pandemic would be much, much larger. Probably right now, compared to December when we published the projections, we are in between the, the orange and the red line, I would say, with the new variants of the virus and a, perhaps a slower deployment of the vaccines that we thought uh, was back in December. If we can move to the next slide. Here are our projections. I'm not going to step much on them because I think for the Euro area and for the European Union, they are very much aligned with the ones that they plan, uh, showed. I think here the key point is to say that yes, uh, we are seeing recovery over the next two years, but I think the recovery will be gradual and mild. And as he put emphasis on, we will only see a recovery to pre-pandemic uh, levels by the end of 2022. So we move to the next slide here. I wanted to show how uh, in recent uh, months, uh, we've seen uh, at least since, uh, since December, we've seen the reintroduction of restrictions and also to a certain extent, a slower deployment of the vaccines. And this is, um, is having an impact on the, on the recovery, which is in fact moderating. So I think in Europe, um, we've seen a bit of a loss of momentum spending and also high frequency indicators of mobility have declined, especially in those countries where the containment measures are, are in increasing. So I think the main point here that I want to emphasize is that we are still in a critical phase of the crisis. And it will be important, especially on the health side, uh, not to let the guard down. 
So if we can move to the next slide, please. Next one. I here I, I very much agree with Beckland's point that it's true that uh, in Europe and elsewhere policymakers have reacted uh, promptly, and I think that the support has been large and uh, rapid and also unprecedented. But um, there are still many tricky issues. And the first point is that I agree that the fiscal support uh, needs to be maintained and to avoid the too rapid uh, fiscal tightening. So here, what you see is what happened uh, during the previous financial crisis, where in the euro area, the fiscal tightening happened too quickly. That's the, that's the drop in the orange triangle that you see in 2011 and 2013. Of course, it didn't only happen in, in Europe, it also happened um, in the US, as you see on the right hand side. So what would be the impact of a quick withdrawal? I think that is still uh, the situation is difficult, uh, not only for households in terms of unemployment, etc. But also, we haven't seen uh, many bankruptcies yet, but this can come. So the support uh, should be maintained. Now, uh, next slide, please. And it's not only that it's needed, but also I think the current conditions allow governments to maintain this support. What this chart uh, shows is that even with much higher debt today than in 2014, debt services payments are today much lower. And that's the blue bar than back in 2014 um, in most countries. And, um, and even if the, um, if the economic situation will stay difficult and unemployment uh, will be high, I think given the fact that we will likely not see a pressure on inflation, this means that rates will stay low for some time, which means that governments will be able to finance uh, that higher spending and that higher debt that, as Declan said, uh, will come or is coming already. So next slide, please. Moving about how to use uh, that money. I agree uh, with Declan that it's important to keep uh, providing uh, support to households and companies that have been affected by, by the COVID and provide a sort of a bridge, I think, to the, to the recovery. So as Declan suggests that uh, it's been very important, the use of job retention schemes. Here on the left-hand side, what I put is of these schemes are still uh, in many countries. There are still many people that are covered uh, by them. And I think that uh, this has been crucial because we've seen that unemployment has increased much less uh, than we saw during the previous crisis. I think in the euro area has been only around one percentage point, which is quite mild given the size of the crisis. So I think that these programs uh, need to stay in place. Uh, and uh, demand. And also, as the clan said, we need to start to think about once uh, the, the pandemic starts to recede, how to gradually phase them out. Uh, they will need to be phased out. Why? Because uh, workers will need to move to, uh, to new activities and, and industries. And policies should facilitate and um, on the firm side, uh, here on the right-hand side, what you see is that bankruptcies um, have actually fallen compared to other periods. So I think the, the support that has been provided has been very helpful in that sense. But we also know that um, bankruptcies typically increase after uh, the throat of a crisis. So that means that the support should stay be there, but it needs to be targeted uh, which is not easy to the viable uh, firms, which are those, they are those that would be viable without the pandemic and without the health risk and the social risk, et cetera. So if we move to the next slide, I also wanted to make a point about the divergence uh, and the inequalities that the pandemic is probably going to exacerbate. So as you see on the left-hand side, Disparities uh, in Europe within countries increased uh, after the global financial crisis, and perhaps this pandemic is going to probably is going to uh, to make them larger because uh, we've seen that the that it had a higher impact, especially on southern countries. Also, on, uh, I wanted to make a point about the impact that this can have 
the pandemic can have on intergenerational inequality. Because the young and the poor, uh, they've been most uh, hit. And as you see on the right hand side, unemployment uh, has increased uh, for the youth. So I think this group, uh, especially the youth, will need uh, support and tailored assistance. So moving to, um, to a bit um, the structural transformations that we are going to see both in green and digital. So perhaps on the digital side, um, I think that with COVID, we are going to see, we are seeing a fast forward uh, digitalization. And uh, we've seen, of course, a wave of experimentation, more telework, uh, more uh, online sales, et cetera. But I think this digital future has not really arrived equally for everyone. Um, we see that uh, looking at the data, large firms are doing well, they can use big data, et cetera. But only around 10% of, firm, of small firms do. And it's the same for telework. Uh, it's easy for some professions, but not so obvious for others. So, so it's important to have supportive policies to avoid that this digitalization creates uh, differences uh, across people, across firms, et cetera. So moving to the next slide, please. Now about the recovery and the resilience facility, I do agree that it has uh, it's been a bold, a very important step. And, and I think that uh, it can provide a meaningful uh, boost uh, to the European Union growth, especially for the countries that have been most hit. Um, I think um, public investment is, is being, being quite weak. So when you, when you look at the left-hand side, I put here a chart that shows public and private investment. And what you see is that public investment, uh, especially after the previous crisis, fell uh, quite a lot and has increased a bit, but it's been moderate. And for private investment, it's also it's a similar picture. So, so the, the recovery and the resilience facility will be important, but I think it will depend on of course, on the quality of that spending, so how that money is used. And also, it will be important that it comes on top of spending that governments were already planning, so that it doesn't substitute. And also, uh, I think that the, the point of supporting the green and the digital transformation, this is, this is uh, very important as well. So moving to the next slide, please. On digital, on and how to make uh, good use of, of the European funds, um, I think uh, it's important to have a um, sort of all government approach. Of course, there's the connectivity side and the importance of high quality and affordable broadband. And as, as you see on the left hand side, there are still uh, gaps in Europe between rural and remote areas, which are important to fill in if we want some spillovers from the productivity that we see in, in the cities. And then also the gaps I mentioned before for SMEs. But I think it will also be important to, um, to support workers in this transition to a more digitalized world. And this comes through a both better training and a skilling. And, um, and we know that in particular low skilled workers, they don't have such an easy time to access the upskilling. And then uh, to conclude, um, I wanted to say a few words, next slide, on, um, on climate. So I think that um, with the recovery programs, I think it is an opportunity to align uh, policies uh, more closely with the long-term climate objectives. So we've seen uh, reductions in, in emissions, but of course, this this will not be enough to address uh, climate change. And as you see on the left-hand side, we've seen from previous crises that emissions tend to rebump. Uh, they, they tend to come up uh, quickly when the recovery starts. And also, is um, we will need large investments in low carbon technologies, especially on, on innovation, but also in diffusion of those technologies. And, and the COVID uncertainty and also the fact oil prices don't make those investments uh, very easy at the moment. So, 
Um, so that's uh, that's the point I wanted to make with the right hand type chart, uh, where you see that that when low when fossil fuel prices are low, this means uh, they are correlated with um, low global patenting of low carbon technology. So I think the European um, uh, the money coming from the from the funds will be very important to support the European Green Deal. And, and make progress uh, to meet the zero net emissions uh, in the EU for 2022, which is the goal. And, uh, and this will require investment, but uh, probably it will not be only investment. Uh, there will also be a need to change um, complementary policies in terms of pricing and also in terms of uh, regulations. So I will leave it uh, there. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Aida, uh, for, for your comments. Um, uh, even here, a lot of interesting points that I hope we'll be able to, to, to pick up again. Um, one thing I, I want to start off with is that you both have mentioned um, how crucial it is to um, ensure that the phasing out of support um, is well thought and does not uh, come as a sudden event, for example, in, in the course also of this year. Um, and so actually I wanted to hear uh, from both of you, what would you recommend in this regard? And uh, what would you respond to those who might fear that once the support stops, that's actually when the crisis will eventually start so that the crisis is not even here yet. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'd like to hear from both of you what, what you think of this. Aida, maybe you can go first and then uh, we'll go to the clan. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I think I'll, I would like to go back to my previous point about, um, I think that one of the lessons that we've learned uh, with this crisis is a wider use of, of the job retention schemes. And I think this has been quite uh, important, as I said before, to, uh, to see a lower increase in unemployment uh, that we would have expected. So I think, um, as I said, it will be important to maintain this support for now, but also this, needs, this support has to be adapted. So it has to be temporary, but also it, it has to, uh, to help these transitions that we are going to most likely see. You know, We are going to see changes in sectors, uh, we are going to see some firms going bankrupt. So what we need is, is to adapt those job retention schemes to provide, um, I would say, incentives to, uh, to workers uh, to train, uh, first of all, to get some training, to get ready uh, for future work. And, and at the same time, also, they need to be uh, focused. They need to be more targeted, I think. Uh, to the specific sectors that are really being the most affected by the pandemic. So less wide support, more concentrated. So that's a point on the, on the job retention schemes. Now, on the, um, on the firm support, so, so I think it's, it's a similar point. Um, I think it, it needs to be uh, temporary. And also, it needs to be targeted. So, as I think uh, Declan made the point um, during the first phase of the crisis, I think the support has been quite good at um, dealing with liquidity problems in firms. Now, I think that um, as we move to other stages of the crisis, we are going to see more problems of solvency among firms. And I think that uh, here, these are these are trickier issues because. Um, because I think in Europe, but also elsewhere, um, we are, policies are not so well geared to help this quickly uh, debt restructuring. And I think there will be uh, a need to focus on that. So how to improve the efficiency of liquidation procedures? How do you make restructuring more faster and easier? And also a third point is, uh, you know, how do you facilitate the entry of new firms? Um, are going to provide uh, employment, you know, for, for those people who are going to look for jobs. So I think it's important there to reduce barriers in product markets to facilitate uh, the entry of new firms. So I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. 
Um, thank you. Um, Declan, any, any further thoughts? I, look, I, I think it's, I, I don't think it's fair to say that the crisis begins once the, <laughs> the, the pandemic is over, but, but it's true that we will face uh, policy challenges of a different nature. I think it's, I do, I do think it's fair, however, to say that, you know, the, the sort of lasting structural impacts of the crisis, we actually don't know what they will be. I mean, they're, they're, they're unknowable. We know they will, we, I, mean, I think Aida made some very good points on, you know, there, there's kind of, a, unemployment is likely to go up. The, as one withdraws some of the temporary support measures, you know, there, inevitably this will imply that some jobs will be lost and equally, you know, the, the, the supports which have been provided to companies and the moratoria on uh, foreclosures, um, there are insol you know, insolvencies uh, will, will inevitably increase. So the question I think is how do, we, how do we manage that? I think the first thing is, you know, we need to avoid kind of cliff edge, abrupt withdrawal of the emergency supports and do this in a kind of a phased intelligent way so that one quickly withdraws the supports from those jobs or those companies which can't be saved but provides the necessary support to those jobs and companies where with restructuring or with support, they can actually maintain viable. The really tricky thing there is how do you actually do that? I mean, it's easy to say, you know, you, it's easy to say in theory, but in practice, it's extremely difficult to identify that. Now, how, I know, I, so I, honestly, how do I think we go about that? One is I think a, a bit of policy experimentation is needed. We should, we should try things, see if it works, compare what's working in some countries, compare experiences across countries. Second thing is I think you need, we need to try to think about some sort of incentive effects um, so that, you know, that if you're providing additional uh, supports to companies and they may require some sort of solvency support or equity type instruments, uh, that there's some sort of skin in the game for the, 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 corp, the companies themselves, or, okay? Third is maybe, you know, governments don't really have a good track record in doing this kind of thing, so maybe, you know, to the extent that you know uh, the banking sector or financial sector can be involved, they might they might be better at uh, let's say uh, distinguishing distinguishing between those companies which just need additional liquidity, those which need you know a bit of restructuring, and those which just can't be saved. Uh, another point I think, and, and Aida mentioned it, is we need to recognize. I think we need to try and get ahead of the curve while we still can on the insolvency frameworks. Um, even, com even companies which have relatively good insolvency frameworks, they're probably not fully geared up for the wave which is coming. And when we talk about insolvency frameworks, I think actually, in, in essence, a lot of what we're talking about is actually pre-insolvency uh, to facilitate the restructuring of those co corporates which are potentially viable uh, with a bit of restructuring. So that can, you know, it can be arbitration procedures, it can be making sort of more automated solutions for, 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 for lower levels of uh, indebtedness. I think we, we need to be we need to try and get ahead of the curve. The Commission did publish a, a paper on an updated NPL strategy, which also talked about things on you know there's things that can be done on um, secondary markets for for for, uh, for 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 debt for the banks for NPLs, um, better data which allows uh, easier flow of information and, and assessment of, of corporates, and then the final thing I think can be done is I mean we need to get these recovery and resilience plans uh, designed, uh, designed and operational as quickly as possible so that we can get these funds into our economies as of the middle of, of, of this year so that we can really provide the support when the output gaps are negative and most needed. But you know there is a trade-off here between uh, time and quality. Uh, it's not just a question of throwing the money out and uh, just, you know accepting whatever uh, you know just, just for the sake of getting it quickly. I mean, what really matters is we've got to get the right reforms, we've got to get the right investments, but we've got to balance that with, you know, there is a need to do this quite quickly. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and indeed, um, let us reflect a bit maybe on, on this potential trade-off that we're facing at the moment, which is, um, on the one hand, uh, spurring the economic recovery in the very short term, but at the same time, um, enabling structural reforms that will have effects um, in, in the medium term. And, and I think um, the clan, the next generation EU package is trying to do um, both somewhat at, at the same time. And do you see a struggle between these two, these two aims, the short term recovery and, and the longer term transformations, which are not only about the green and digital transitions, but also about, for example, labor market reform, pension reform, um, and, and more structural changes. 
Um, look, I think there is a balance to be struck here uh, between, um, as you, you know, designing, you know, uh, you know, if one wants to get the funds out into the economy quickly, one's got to go for measures either on the tax side or, or, or sort of more subsidy type programs. Um, and it's more obviously the time constraints that make it difficult, more difficult to, to design, uh, you know, new difficult structural reforms from scratch. Um, at the same time, if we want to actually build back better and take the opportunity of, of uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the shift in behavior, the shift in, in, in structures we've seen in our economy uh, to, to facilitate the green and digital transition, plus the, you know, for the first time, significant funds available at European level to support reforms, you've got to take a bit of time to design them properly. Now, how do we, how do we get, how do we, how do we strike that, uh, that balance right? I mean, in several ways. One is, I mean, I mean, the recovery resilience plans which we asked member states to put forward, they are supposed to combine reforms and investments. It's not just investments, it's reforms and investments. And, you know, Aida mentioned in our presentation, um, you know, part of what you need to do if you want to deal with the energy, uh, let's say, the, 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 the green transition, it's not just about spending more on renewables or, or sustainable transport. Uh, that only makes sense if you've got, uh, let's say, reforms that you have a, a viable or efficient uh, energy market. Um, one will need to have uh, appropriate regulators so that pricing and uh, the regulatory framework is stable for investors in these sectors. So you, you need to combine both. What, what we're asking member states to do is, you know, to build upon the reforms that were previously identified over several years in the country specific recommendations to build upon their energy and climate transition plans. Um, this is, you know, no one's asking anybody to kind of reinvent the wheel here or come up with uh, you know, brand new uh, policies. Many of the reforms which uh, we're, 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 we're currently discussing with member states, uh, they're very well known as to what has to be done. It's now a question of let's agree a timetable uh, for agreeing them and we will provide necessary financial supports to implement them. Thanks. Um, thank you, Aida. I have a question from you for the view from the audience and then I'll go to those who have raised their hand. Um, the question is uh, from Simona Guardiardo, who in the context of building back better, uh, we often talk about uh, the green and digital transitions. Um, but what would you what would you say are the other things that need to be there to ensure fairness, for example, and inclusiveness um, of the recovery? Um, this was a question from from the audience. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Marta, and thanks uh, for that question. Maybe because this is related, and I wanted to jump in also to comment on on your statement that and on the reforms that. You know what type of reform should be prioritized now, etc. And I think that what will be important is to prioritize those type of reforms that support demand at the moment, uh, because we are still uh, in a in a crisis situation with a weak recovery. So it's important to support demand. And which are those? I think um, are those type of reforms that or um, that you know strengthen skills. Uh, and that also speaks to the question that we got from the audience about how to, you know, how to deal with the long-term consequences on inequality, etc. So I think that what we've seen from the from the pandemic is that it has mostly affected uh, people in those sectors uh, that were, you know, uh, affected by the con containment measures, and those are typically low-skill uh, workers, also the young have been affected by, you know, the closure of the schools, etc. So they can have made a point about the scaring effects. So we need to minimize those scaring effects. And that comes through, uh, through skilling, uh, through skilling and also through uh, investing more uh, in helping people find uh, new jobs uh, if that is needed. And that will help them finding a job is uh, will be extremely important to deal with those uh, inequality effects. And then uh, another point is on the type of reforms is the barriers to mobility. I mentioned that during my, my presentation. And I think mobility to move to jobs, to move to new places. So this is in the housing market. Um, also, as I said, barrier to entries uh, for firms. So for new firms to be created, for new investment uh, to be done. I think these are all demand enhancing 
type of uh, reform. So if we are to prioritize without within all the reforms that you know the the commission typically recommends, I would I would put the emphasis on those that. Um, thank you very much. Um, I see that one participant, two participants have the raise, their hand uh, raised. Um, so we will unmute you and then you will be able to speak um, and pose your question orally. Um, I will first go to Gabriela Bakinska. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. And then I'll go to Bernard Grimm. Um, Gabriela, can you... Yes, um, hello. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Gabriela Bacinska Reuters, thanks for giving me the floor and pronouncing my name right. Uh, because uh, both of the speakers have mentioned um, uh, the different inequalities that are uh, driven and exacerbated by COVID uh, and because there is so much hope that the um, RRF spending and MFF spending would sort of help alleviate that. I wanted to ask you about one other specific target beyond digitalization and, and uh, green projects where both MFF and RRF have specific numerical targets. Another priority that is mentioned in in this legislation is gender equality or combating gender inequality. Um, but as far as I know, there are no numerical targets. And I was wondering, you know, in designing these reforms, in designing this spending, in guiding member states and how they should um, map out spending of these billions available or that will be available, you know, how do you even measure that these projects um, help fight gender inequality? Because th there is no metrics. Like, how do we, you know, we're trying, we've set ourselves a goal, but we haven't even attached any metrics to it. So I wonder how we can, you know, think that we achieved it or not. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I'll go directly to Bernard Grimm. Bernard, can you... Um... Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, please. Thank you. I, I just wanted first to thank Aida and Declan for their presentation. They were extremely clear. Uh, I'm representing the biotechnology uh, uh, industry, and my question will certainly not surprise the two speakers. It's uh, it's around you know short term and long term, and also this idea of building back and building better. Uh, I believe you know we are in a time of disruptions, and with time of disruptions, you have always the opportunity to think a little bit more longer term. And I just wanted to have your views because this is a huge risk is that we build back, but maybe not for the future. We build back back as I call it. And I wanted to have your views on what could be done better maybe to invest in what we believe are the industry for the, of the future for Europe and making sure that Europe is competitive. Obviously there is the digital industry, there is the green industry. There are some other big industry that can have a huge impact. And one slide that you showed was striking to me. It's when, I, when you see in the south of Europe, the number of young people that are unemployed. I believe this should be one of the priorities we look for first to see how we can go get them back to work, but also get them back to work for the jobs of the future. So I just wanted to have your views on that one on how you know we could do a better balance and making sure that we prepare the young generation for the future of Europe. Um, thank you. Um, I'll come to you both uh, on these two questions. So the first on uh, gender equality and targets and how can we measure that? Um, and the second uh, on building better. Um, Declan, why don't you go first and then we'll go to Ada. Thanks. Yeah. Um, no, look, I think it's, it, 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 it's, correct in the, it's correct that for the digital and the green transitions, there are quantitative benchmarks or targets uh, which the uh, RRF funding, uh, funding is supposed to reach. And there will have to therefore be a sort of a, for, there is, you know, we're putting in place a formal methodology uh, on, you know, as to how member states are supposed to estimate the, the contribution towards those uh, twin objectives, which will then be formally assessed. Now then, uh, the I mean, gender equality, I think, was, was there actually in the initial commission proposal, but it certainly came much more to the fore during the trilogue process and, and pushed very strongly by the European Parliament. So I think, in, I think the, so we, we're obviously now having to sort of take a, a fresh look at the, the sort of guidance and approach we're giving to our member states in how they should set about designing the, the, their recovery resilience plans. And then we will then have to follow up with that in our, in our, in our monitoring and surveillance. The, the, the promotion or the support for, 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 for gender equality initiatives, I think, is a long-standing 
is a long-standing objective of the union. Uh, there's been a, you know, a, a considerable amount of work done on that. There are many, many indicators which are used in, the, you know, in different contexts, uh, the social scoreboard, et cetera. So I don't think it's a lack of uh, indicators which we have, uh, but we will have to invest you know, as a commission some time to develop a, a sort of, a, as you say, a more, a more structured approach on uh, one, guiding member states on how they should respond to that, and secondly, how you know what sort of assessment framework we will put in place to evaluate uh, and co uh, the contribution to it. I mean, I have to say, I mean, we're in, we are in discussions with uh, member states, all member states, on the design of their recovery and resilience plans. And there, I mean, in, in all the plans that I have seen, there certainly have been elements in there which have contributed, uh, which we, we, which would contribute to to gender equality. Now, a number of member states, I mean, even without waiting for the the outcome of the trilogue put the gender uh, equality issue front and center of their own uh, draft national re recovery and resilience uh, programs. So, so I, I think there's good elements which we can build on, but we will need to come back to member states with guidance and, uh, and have some sort of reporting framework built around it, even if there isn't the formal quantitative target as we have for the other areas. Thanks. Um, thanks, Aida, any, any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, so perhaps to complement uh, Declan's response, I'll note that on the gender side, so as I said, uh, we've seen that the impact of the pandemic on, on women has been more intense uh, because typically they are overrepresented in, in the sectors, in the, in the service sectors that have been most. So I think that's a, that's a first point. So, so having that in mind when allocating the money and I think it will be important uh, to also bear in mind that even if labor force participation has increased so much overall, not only in Europe, but also elsewhere, there is a risk of, you know, uh, disengagement perhaps among certain, certain groups of, of women. And I think the type of, besides the, about how to think about how to spend the money and the type of measures, I think that what is, uh, what is critical is, um, is looking into whether there are these incentives to work uh, for women tax in the tax code. Sometimes it happens in some countries. Also, uh, bear in mind the need for financing uh, childcare. Um, you know, a question that was linked to the question by Bernard. You know, uh, we know that investments in education and and childcare early on they are the ones that typically pay off the best, and it's important to focus them on on children from low incomes. And also this helps uh, mothers as well. So I think uh, that's an important point. And then uh, for women also the policies related to work-life balance. So, so leave uh, around maternity, sharing a uh, leave with uh, partners, um, you know, working schedules, all these type of things. I think they are, they are part of the toolkit or the, that the commission looks at. So I think these are all uh, important elements. Um, thank you. Um, Declan, a question from you for you on, on inequalities among member states. Um, Alison Hunter in the audience is asking, how is it, how to ensure positive effects on convergence, um, I assume she's speaking about the recovery and facility, in the absence as of as yet bottom-up approach to targeting of the facilities investment? Um, please, um, yes. I'm not, I'm not quite sure I, I'm not quite sure I understand a bit about the bottom up approach to investment but I mean I think the in terms of convergence first of all the allocation key is very strongly skewed towards member states with lower uh, GDP per capita incomes so if you take the you know if you take the scale of let's say, I'm only talking about the grants so which don't have to be repaid if you take a country like Croatia uh, Greece um, Bulgaria I mean, the allocations, the, the grant component is, you know, somewhere between eight to 11 percentage points of GDP. So, I mean, over a three to four year period, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very, very significant, uh, that's a very, very significant amount. The figures are lower in, for, for other member states, but in, you know, in many cases, including some larger Euro area countries, the, you know, the, the, the grant component is, uh, you know, four or five percentage points of GDP. And I think the big the big impact of that will, will actually show up in one of the slides Aida had, which actually showed the evolution of public investment 
in the last 15, 20 years. And what we saw at the, on the, you know, from the global financial crisis was public investment levels were the first things to be cut as part of the consolidation. And actually they never recovered uh, to their pre, pre-global financial crisis levels. And actually the level of public investment in most, Euro, most member states, EU, not Euro area in particular, are actually not at a level to cover uh, depreciation. So actually there is a net de- disinvestment on an annual basis in the terms of the global, uh, sorry, the public capital uh, stock. Now, the fact that these are grants and don't have to be repaid, these will have a, ze- these will have a net zero impact upon the budget balance. So this will allow you know, those countries which have been impacted by the crisis to actually not only sustain their public investment levels uh, in, in, you know, during what will be a difficult period, but actually to probably increase them, and that should contribute to conversion. Second point I want to make is there's a very, I mean, the, the, the recovery resilience facility investments, I mean, these come on top of cohesion funds, uh, which are already very significant transfers in some member states. And I think one of the key things actually is going to be is actually to ensure good alignment between what is funded under the RRF and what's funded under the recovery resilience facility. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, so I want to, um, because we have had a few questions on, on fiscal sustainability. Um, so Aida, first a question for you a bit in general on um, in, in the current uh, economic conditions uh, when it comes to inflation, when it comes to low interest rates, is high debt to GDP less of an issue than it was before? So is it becoming more accepted that countries are very high debt levels? And in this respect, Declan, a question um, to you from Dara Turnbull in the audience. Um, can you give any insight into how and when the public deficit and debt to GDP rules will be applied? Um, so uh, she's referring, I imagine, to the SGP escape clause. Or, and also I add, um, is there any discussion around their reform, uh, potential reform before their reapplication? Um, Aida, please, and then, and then we go to the ground. Thanks. Uh, thanks for this question. So maybe I go back to one point I made in my slide that, um, you know, it's not that I want to minimize the importance of high debt, but I, as I showed uh, in my slides, uh, paying for that debt today less burdensome for governments because interest rates are low and probably these are going to stay low because you know the economy is, is in a situation where we don't see inflationary pressures we are in a crisis so so i think that this gives governments <clears throat> the space sorry to keep providing this uh this supportive um uh, fiscal um fiscal spending and then over time, we will need to see a gradual consolidation, but the time is not now, and not this year, not next year. And, and I think I would complement, um, you know, the point that was made by the clan before about investment. I think, you know, it's important. It's not only the spending, but what type of spending. And I think, as I made the point too, the promotion of investment is important. Uh, for the recovery, for future, uh, for future growth, and as I I showed, um, that was uh, that was uh, quite weak. And then on the question, pro, you know, I mean, just to say one comment on the fiscal framework, you know, because now the, the rules are suspended, etc. But probably at some point there will be the time to to rethink uh, the fiscal framework in, in Europe because uh, we know uh, from before that the stability and growth pact was not uh, leading to, uh, to good outcomes. Uh, and one of them was that we saw procyclical spending uh, in the euro area. So, you know, this will require rethinking uh, going forward. And I think, uh, you know, there's an important focus on that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Declan. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with Aida that, you know, the, 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 low, the low interest rates you know, provides, if you will, room or a little bit of scope for, for member states to continue fiscal supports. Um, but there is no, re- I mean, one has to be careful here. Um, debt to GDP ratios are, are very high in a number of member states above 100% to GDP. And okay, maybe, you know, that does mean that uh, those member states are going to be susceptible to interest rate shocks going forward. And we have seen in the past that market, uh, market sentiment can turn quite quickly. So, I think it, one should probably look at it more as a window of opportunity to, 
to, to, to, to put in place policies uh, that can deliver sustainability. But I don't think one should look at it as a sort of a you know, quasi-permanent situation, which is a sort of a get out of jail card uh, on a permanent basis. Um, now, regarding the, you know, when the timing of uh, discussions on when to uh, lift or, uh, the, the general escape clause and go back to normal surveillance, uh, uh, here, I think we, the commission has, has not uh, come to a final view on this. Um, we, will come, we will come back to the issue uh, in spring when we will have a new economic forecast, um, not the interim forecast which is coming out in February, but probably more in uh, our, our, our spring forecast. We will be getting uh, fiscal reportings in the end of April. We will have stability convergence programs. So it's a natural point, rendezvous point to come back and look at these fiscal issues. Now, whether the conditions will be right at that stage to decide to lift or to, 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 to move away from the general escape clause, that's very, much an, that's very much an open question. I think that it's very clear to everybody that it's a, the you know, general escape clause applies in 2021. There's a really quite a very wide consensus on not withdrawing fiscal support too early. So even if one starts a process of, of talking about or discussing uh, re reverting to, you know, um, no, let's say more standard approaches to fiscal surveillance, that does not imply one automatically goes back to the, 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 the full application uh, of the, of the pre-existing rules. On the, the, the governance review, uh, we've kind of put that on hold during the, the, the pandemic. Um, indeed, I think we probably will need to, uh, to, to uh, come back and look at that issue. Again, it's, it's really a question of what is the appropriate, what, you know, what is the best sort of uh, timing uh, of, for, for that. Um, indeed, you know, there, there, you know, it has been put forward that there's an argument to make a link to the, the, the relaunch of that discussion to, uh, you know, whether that should be done, you know, in conjunction or, or in sequence with uh, discussions around the general escape clause. I think it's just too, it's just too early for us to to see. I think one thing we do need to to do we we, we did launch a discussion in February of last year on the the, the functioning of the the fiscal framework um, and, and indeed the wider governance rules. I think we probably need to start with uh, asking ourselves: Well, are there additional or different lessons we would need to learn from the from, from, from the pandemic? Um, you know, there are there are perhaps important uh, lessons that are worth thinking about. I mean, we have seen the we have seen very effective fiscal policy support and proactive fiscal support. support. We have seen the value of uh, of, of these short term work schemes. Um, at the same time, we also should recognize that uh, you know our public finances have been you know have taken a big hit, um, and you know the you know in some cases the the potential risks have actually uh, materially increased. And then, of course, finally, we have actually put in place, you know, fairly significant fiscal supports at European level for, for, for member states, which was precisely the argument which many countries were, were, were putting forward at the time, which was needed. So I think it's we, no decision taken. We will have to probably come back and discuss these issues in the course of, of, of this year. Thanks. Um, thank you, Declan. Thank you both. Uh, we have come to an end uh, to our time. Um, I think my thank you for this uh, very interesting discussion. My main takeaway is that so far, um, governments and the European Union has have been managing quite well this unexpected, um, unprecedented crisis, but that very high uncertainty remains. And so one has to be careful as to what to do as next step and plan accordingly. Um, but this is a moment of very high stakes and but also very high opportunity. So there is an opportunity for implementing good reforms, good investments and, and learn from, from this crisis. Um, thank you very much, Aida. Thank you very much, Declan, for your um, interesting insights, clear explanations. I'm sure our audience um, has enjoyed the event. Uh, thank you also to all, uh, everyone in the audience for the participation, the questions. And uh, the EPC, we will be continuing discussing um, the crisis and how to get out of it um, in the future. So stay tuned. Um, thank you very much. And I wish you all a good um, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.